Hello everybody, welcome to Darren McGarvey's Common People, episode 3. Just before we start, anybody who has a problem with my Scottish diction is welcome to confront me in a speaking English competition. Just want to thank everybody who's checked the previous couple of episodes. The stuff is mainly on YouTube right now, but as I said before in the first episode, we'll be building things out. So I've been getting a lot of questions about, can we listen to this on Spotify? What are the plans going forward? Just give us a bit of time, we're just getting into a kind of workflow right now in terms of how we do things week to week but things will develop and thank you for your for your curiosity and for your patience today something a little different i would like to address some current political events that are occurring in scotland so for anyone who is not from scotland who is watching a quick explainer uh, the scottish national party which is scotland's biggest political party uh, the, the the uk's third biggest political party uh, and has been in power in Scotland for about 16 years. It's currently going through a very unusual period of, of contested leadership. And this is interesting to watch. It's also quite worrying for people who are pro-independence and pro-SNP. And basically, I just want to break down my own take on this, which is that one thing no one seems to have considered is that the SNP actually taking a hit or a loss or suffering some sort of defeat might in the long run not only be better for the Scottish National Party, for Scotland, but also for the cause of independence. And I realise that that might seem a bit paradoxical. So just give me a bit of time to lay out my thinking on this. The story of the SNP's rise from a kind of fringe nationalist movement regarded kind of scornfully by mainstream opinion to the dominant political force in Scottish politics is one for the ages, right? It just cannot be denied. This was a tiny fringe movement that has then since come to dominate the entire political landscape, turned Scotland from red to yellow overnight, and really has kind of set the tone and direction of Scottish politics for a very, very long time. This dominance defied not only naysayers in the commentaria and in the public, but the very creation and design of the Scottish Parliament itself, which was created and configured precisely to, in part, ward off the threat posed by uh, Scottish nationalism and independence. Obviously, in 2014, we had an independence referendum, and following the Yes Movement's defeat, uh, in my view, a period of reflection should have followed. Uh, but sadly, many in the movement, and quite understandably so, uh, they, they, they decided that the matter, despite the referendum result, was not settled. Uh, and, and many actually kind of adopted a mentality where the result could be chalked up only to unionist propaganda, the kind of individual cowardice, selfishness and short-sightedness of no voters who were regarded and encouraged in some quarters to be regarded as a kind of monolith who thought with one brain, who acted with one motive, who pursued one singular agenda. So very quickly we went from a movement that was quite politically diverse and robust in terms of its discourse um, to being told that uh, both votes SNP was what, what we had to do at every election and every election was to be a proxy referendum on independence. Uh, who cares about getting the Tories out of London? We need another referendum. Who cares the SNP policy around things like drug deaths contributed directly to the shocking rise of deaths uh, over the last period? We need another referendum. In Westminster, it, it became kind of packed to the gunnels with new faces. Many actually only taking their first political steps only a few years prior. And I think today we see the results of that refusal to pause for thought, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, for many years, I think the most popular uh, political figure in the UK, uh, hastily resigned recently, pretty much aware that she has run out of road, exhausted by the whole experience of being a lightning rod for political division and controversy, 
Um, and, and subsequently, this has plunged her party, which is not necessarily institutionally capable of handling division. It is probably the most centralised institution in Scotland. Um, so they've been plunged into kind of open warfare. There are power struggles going on for the soul of the party, what direction it should go in going forward. And these various forces are competing very fiercely uh, in front of the cameras and behind the scenes to chart a way forward. So what, what no one seems to have considered, and I guess for good reason, is the, the possibility, as I say, that only following uh, perhaps a humbling defeat, uh, an overdue repudiation of their record in government, and their independent strategy, which is a failure, might the SNP finally find the time and the humility to face the hard truths that have to be contended with before you can truly pick yourself up and move on and make progress and stand tall once again. And only really when the wider yes movement becomes untethered from SNP influence and control as it was in its early days, uh, can it really truly begin to, to rebuild itself and rediscover that sense of curiosity, that sense of imagination and quite frankly that sense of audacity to think that Scotland can at some point, when the time is right, when the prospectus is right, once again put that question uh, to the populace. Now, a lot of people focus on the politics of this, and, and obviously that is kind of front and centre, but I want to kind of go a little bit deeper and just talk about the concept of failure and why failure itself is a really important part of anyone's development, any institution's development, any individual's development, any community or nation's development. There is obviously a pain in failure. There is a sense of, of perhaps embarrassment, humiliation, anger. But also what happens is that when, when we fail, often um, this levels pride. And, and when the pride is leveled, then this brings to bear other faculties which were not previously available to us as we were very caught up in maintaining our position or our perceived position. And so this creates fertile ground for, for humility. Right. Now, defying the laws of political gravity for so long has, in the words of another uh, commentator, which I thought were quite fitting, uh, atrophied uh, the Scottish National Party uh, and, by extension, the Scottish government. So every day it has to fight on three fronts. It has to fight on the front of basic governance, which is not doing terribly well on. It has to fight on the front of advancing independence or being seen to advance independence and actually the charade of advancing independence probably is even more energetically inefficient than actually just fighting for independence, having to pretend that there are other referendums coming round the corner, having to develop strategies and announcements to make it seem like that carrot that's been dangled is within reach. That's actually in itself exhausting. But also on the third front, and this is not necessarily commented on a lot, is that they're constantly working to retain power. Now, obviously, many people who are emotionally invested in the SNP believe that that retention of power is absolutely fundamental to independence. And I guess, in a sense, if you're looking at it logically, it is. But what we see with the Scottish National Party in the absence of any real strategy to advance independence is that the goal of retaining power has become its own justification. So it's not necessarily for some other greater end. It's just because it's difficult to let go of power. It's difficult to confront the idea that one day you may be powerless. And so this creates a scenario where a lot of the SNP's energy and resources and thought are poured into areas where it's not necessarily great news for public services in Scotland, for the quality of governance in Scotland, nor for the, the level of consciousness uh, present in the discourse. When you have a significant section of the population who always seem to believe that independence is round the corner, even though I would say it's a good five to ten years before there's going to be another referendum. And I'm sorry that that might be painful for some people to hear, but that is truly uh, my feeling on this. So when a political party holds power, when a political party holds power for as long as the SNP has, it's usually not evidence of uh, popularity, of endorsement, of good governance. 
it's usually evidence of some mechanism at play which gives them a decisive advantage, right? So it's like a cheat code, a democratic cheat code. And if you can tap into that as a political party or movement, then you're certainly on a winner. So with the Conservative Party at UK level, it's obviously the advantage of having vast wealth at their disposal through uh, rich donors. Um, it's also the advantage of having powerful media allies in the press who will frame events in such a way as to always try and make the perception among a significant section of the public that the Conservative Party is the only way to go. Also, the, the Tories have benefited from an electoral system at UK level, which is unrepresentative, right? So first past the post, the, the, the electoral imperative that underpins that means that you can have scenarios where uh, a government has a lot of power, but it's disproportionate to who actually supported it in the country. So in Scotland, for the Scottish National Party, that mechanism has, since 2015, been the performance-enhancing drug of the next referendum. We've seen the, the Brexit vote become the platform on which the next push for independence was launched. But straight away, that's where you started to see a kind of irony and a lack of awareness within the SNP who were thinking short term about the next possible opportunity to hitch the next referendum to whatever event that they could. And while Scotland did vote to stay in the EU, and that is a democratic deficit in action, it's also a democratic deficit to attempt to undermine the result only a few years prior, if you're being intellectually honest, of the independence referendum itself. And so straight away, you could see the bad blood already growing as many became quite upset that their Remain vote was sort of seen as a tacit endorsement that Scotland should very quickly agitate uh, for another referendum. And I think Sturgeonism, as it's been called, uh, is characterised by ironies and hypocrisies along the way, uh, right up until only, you know, a few short weeks ago. Now, the thing about performance enhancing drugs is, uh, it's great when you're on them. You feel like you're flying, you feel like you've been imbued with special superpowers, but there are also some nasty side effects of it. Uh, you can end up developing a bit of an ego that's not relative to what you're actually bringing to the table. And also, uh, you're not really got a true picture of what your genuine power is, what your genuine ability is. And it's only when the, the, the performance enhancing drugs are no longer being administered that you're confronted with a choice. Do you continue to take more or do you, you lose some of the gains that, that came to you as a result of the performance enhancing drug? And I think that this is a process now that the SNP are definitely on where the performance enhancing drugs are beginning to wear off and we're starting to get a true picture of the composition of the SNP, the political diversity of the SNP, and also the, the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities, and quite frankly, some of the hubris of the SNP. So one of the things that the SNP is, is never really faced is a true electoral assessment of its record in government, and this has engendered a culture of unaccountability at every level of governance, and this goes right back to just after the independence referendum, when what should, as I say, have been a period of reflection on why we lost, instead became this kind of 24-7 rally. So you had the bunker mentality being adopted, which seen various players um, capitalising, quite rightly, on the enthusiasm to keep the fight up, to stay in the trenches, and they were kind of funded to the teeth to take the fight to unionists, and this created straight away perverse incentives uh, to ignore any kind of autopsy on the re referendum result where we went wrong and instead just keep on pushing based on a number of assumptions I, which I felt even at the time were quite unsafe. So within little time, uh, a strange consensus was kind of reached that the fastest way to get another referendum was to basically bet the whole farm on the Scottish National Party. And I think in hindsight, that has been a naive collective decision, which all but seen the Yes movement absorbed by an increasingly centrist, managerialist, knob twiddling uh, political operation. So what could have been a more politically diverse post-independence referendum discourse uh, around the campaign strengths, weaknesses, as well as a new vision for how independence could be achieved was kind of sacrificed on the altar of SNP brand loyalty. 
really, when you look at where the SNP is currently at, you can see a lot of the the uh, chickens coming home to roost on that front. The other thing is that if you're looking at this through a kind of emotional lens, which obviously a lot of people won't, but there has been a tremendous buildup of frustration and anger and resentment. And, and, and to be fair, some of it is legitimate and it's not just among unionists, it's within the Yes movement itself. So there's this buildup of frustration uh, at the SNP's dominance in spite of various things. Uh, and this frustration has to be discharged at some point. And actually, ironically, it might be the case that if the SNP suffers a sufficient humbling experience, then that emotional uh, buildup can in fact be discharged in a way that might allow people to look at it with fresh eyes, whether from the Yes movement or from, from further afield. So as the performance enhancing drug of the second referendum is wearing off, the SNP's institutional ego is being slowly relativized. So there is no more of a correlation between um, the level of support for the SNP, what the SNP's actual capability is, and you're starting to see it slowly being held accountable in ways that perhaps it wasn't before, not least from many of its own members. So we have the declining membership, we have the, the arguably flatlining support for independence, you have prominent figures openly slating not only its, its record in government, but the culture of governance within it. And uh, so pro-independence people who have really been marched up to the hill so many times that they still genuinely believe that another referendum is, is just around the corner might have some challenging and humbling years ahead. And my, my view is that while that might push independence into the middle distance, I actually think that the SNP keeping power, remaining unaccountable for the record in government, and also this culture within the SNP that we are hearing more and more about, which really is a lack of accountability, then I think that that actually pushes independence even further away. And so the difficult take here for me is being pro-independence, and, and desiring to see good governance in Scotland, perhaps above all else, is that I think that the, the Scottish National Party has to go through that thing that all people and all things have to go through when they're on that pink cloud, when they're flying, when they're coasting. They have to fall, they have to fail, and then they have to look at why that's happened and they have to build themselves back up. I'm grateful to you for tuning in. I know that that was a bit of a longer take. A couple of quick things just before we go. Uh, I'm on tour right now. You can check out uh, the availability of shows uh, for the social distance between us live. There's a link tree in my Twitter pinned right at the top. I'll be performing all over the UK. We have dates in Newcastle, Liverpool. We have dates in London, Manchester. I've already done Dundee, Aberdeen, Edinburgh. I'll be doing Kirkcaldy and a whole load of other places. So if you fancy coming and seeing me live for more of a kind of a performance side of, of what I do, then please look into that. Uh, once again, just like and subscribe, leave some comments. I'm trying to be very mindful of my tone here. I realise that I've, I'm as guilty as anybody in the Yes movement for sometimes being a bit snide, for sometimes talking in generalities, for sometimes letting my own personal resentments against certain people or ideas it cloud my judgment in terms of what sort of tone I bring to discourse. And so part of the reason that, that we're building this platform and it's been a long-term thing for me is that I recognised back then, if ever I said something that was disagreeable, I had a bad day, or I came out with a take that people didn't agree with, it was very easy for someone in, in the Yes Movement to just pull a plug on me because back then a lot of my public visibility was dependent on that. And so I seen a long time ago that before I could personally re-enter this discussion, then I had to have created an infrastructure around me which gave gave me resilience in the face of that. I had to fail, build myself back up in order to uh, become truly independent. Thank you very much, guys. Hope you have a great weekend and uh, I'll catch you again soon next week.